everybody that wanted to join us tonight is on. If not, this is being recorded and they will be able to watch this a little bit later. I Please bear with me with the technology. I am praying that um, internet works and doesn't kick me out. It already kicked me out once tonight, so I'm hoping it doesn't um, eject me again. But anyway, I wanted to welcome you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and join me tonight. I know it's late in the night, but I wanted to make sure that all your little ones were asleep before we got started on this. So hopefully everybody has sleeping toddlers and preschoolers and you've got the half an hour to just sit back, relax and listen to this presentation tonight. Um, Amy is gonna be helping me with this and moving through the slides as we go along. So Amy, if we could go, well, first of all, just to introduce me, I'm Haley Goldberg. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist. I don't do the um, therapy anymore. I've actually progressed, moved out of therapy and I've transitioned into parent coaching and parent education. So I run parenting classes and I do private coaching work with um, families here in Orange County around parenting. And I specialize in working with families with toddler and preschool age groups. So even though my kids are much older, this is where I spend a lot of my time is with families with young kids. So let's talk about coping with COVID and what does that mean for our kids from an emotional standpoint? What does that mean for our little guys when it comes to their behaviors as well? So I don't know if any of you were on the original call that we had and thinking back to that call with the other experts, we spoke about how our emotions drive our behaviors and that it's important that we really get manage our emotions because if we can manage our emotions, we can manage our behaviors. And one of the things that's happening right now is our emotions are running high, which means behaviors are running high as well. And that's for both our kids and for parents. Everybody's struggling. Our kids are struggling mm. with their behaviors and parents are struggling with um, managing the behaviors. And parents are struggling with keeping our own emotions in check. So next slide, Amy. Thank you. So I want you, as we get started, I want you to think of a behavior your child does that really gets to you and share that one behavior in the chat box with me. I want to see what it is, some of the things that you guys are struggling with with your kiddos. So one behavior they do that really is triggering you right now and put that in the, in the um, chat box. Tantrums, mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about that tonight, what that means and how we manage those tantrums. What else? Stubbornness, okay, yeah, gotta love those strong-willed kids and that's a trait that comes right from the very beginning. Okay, we've got someone who's got kids who, a child who throws things, whatever is in his, in his reach. So throwing things. Yeah, definitely challenging behavior. Okay, so some different things that you're dealing with. Amy, next slide, please. Uh, refusing diaper changes. Yeah, got to love that with our toddlers. Um, the diaper change does become, becomes a power struggle between parent and child. So let's look at how we will manage and work with those behaviors. Lots of different things that are coming in. So the first thing, emotions drive behavior. So the first place we want to be is we want to make sure that we are managing and responding to those big emotions before we get to the behavior. So these are the steps to managing behavior. We have to step one, give our kids time to feel their emotions. Step two, we want to connect with them. Step three, offer coping strategies, and step four is problem solve. So let's look at those in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Okay, allowing them to feel. This is two things. One, I share with parents, it's how we want to start managing behavior in the beginning is to manage their, help them with their emotions first. But it's also so critically important that we help our kids mm. with their emotions because we want to grow, kids to grow up to become adults who are comfortable around their emotions and can lean into their emotions. We don't want them growing up avoiding or resisting their emotions. So in this space, step one, we want to make sure that we hold space for their emotions. Okay, give them time and space with those emotions. If they're not being safe, we want to move their bodies to where it is more safe for them. 
And if they're hitting you or pushing you, kicking you, whatever it might be, we want to hold their hands, not hard, but we want to hold onto their hands to let them know hitting is not okay. I will not let you hurt me, even if you're mad. Um, so holding hands, giving them that message, holding that boundary, they cannot hit, they cannot hurt. And then the last piece with that is we don't want to rush to make those emotions stop. It's tempting to rush that process. Um, we want to make those emotions stop. But truly the greatest gift that we can give our kids is the space to feel their emotions, even if that's maybe more uncomfortable for us. Next slide, please. So step two, once we have given them space to feel their emotions, next step for kiddos is connecting with them, connecting around those emotions. So we want to avoid using logic when your kids are overwhelmed with those big uncomfortable feelings. When a child is emotional, they're unable The emotional state really painful. It's difficult for them. It's really painful. It's difficult for them. Just like they would be if they had a badly scraped knee. We want to respond to them empathetically with that scraped knee. We want to do the same with their emotions. Validate their feelings um, and come with empathy. When we do that, it helps our kids to feel seen. It helps our kids to feel understood which in turn allows them to return to that emotionally regulated state more quickly. So instead of saying, you know, maybe we turned off the TV for them, maybe they're having a hard time around that. Instead of saying, you're gonna be fine, TV's done, we could try connecting with something that says, I can see that you're having a pretty hard time with this TV right now. Um, maybe they were playing with their blocks and their blocks fell down, the tower that they were working on fell down. Maybe someone knocked over the tower. Maybe it doesn't feel like it's a big deal to us, but it's certainly a big deal to them. So instead of saying, it's not a big deal, you can fix that tower. We could try saying, well, but you worked so hard on that and it got knocked down. Oh, that's so disappointing when that happens. So we really want to validate and empathize and connect with our kids. I always tell families that I work with, connection before correction. So often we want to go straight to that correction piece. We've got to do connection before correction. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, coping strategies, step three. So once we've validated and once we've connected with empathy, moving on to the next slide, Amy. We want to offer those coping strategies. So coping strategies will help your little ones get back, leave their, process their emotions. They're going to leave their reactive brains and get back into their rational thinking brains. Okay? We want to help our kids learn to know what helps them feel better when they're overwhelmed by their feelings. And I need you to know it takes about 20 minutes for kids, for the cortisol levels in our body, that, that's our stress hormone, the cortisol levels to, to really... Um, exit the body to feel calm, to feel better. So we wanna give our kids, when we offer them these coping strategies, we wanna give them about 20 minutes to process and work with their coping strategies until they feel better. So when you notice your little ones becoming dysregulated, when they're frustrated, when they're sad, when they're cranky, offer them an activity that you know that they enjoy doing during their calm time and see if that activity helps to get them back to feeling calm. If it works, that's fabulous. Keep note of it. It's a strategy you could use next time your kids are dysregulated. If it doesn't work, make note of that also. You want to try something different next time they're dysregulated until you find what is working for them. So when it comes to coping strategies, we want to offer two coping strategies. One should always be physical connection and touch. And the other could be something that they enjoy. So it could be, you know, offer to hug and do a, or would, do they want to hug to help them with their big emotions or would they rather do a puzzle to help them feel calmer with their emotions? 
do they want to snuggle to help with their big emotions or do they want to go outside and jump on the trampoline to help them get their body and their thinking back to calm so we want to offer those coping strategies two coping strategies one with physical touch one that's another option if your kids are not accepting the coping strategies that you're offering they're not ready for this step is what they're telling you and we've got to go back to step one which is allowing them to feel their emotions okay so next slide please amy here we go here's some coping strategies that are helpful for kids drawing coloring and painting some of our kids need movement or exercise my son was that he wasn't the kid that would just sit and color and draw or paint my girls would do that but Devin needed to move. He needed to get outside in order to get those emotions down to process. Um, breathing, reading, playing music, journaling. And journaling could mean that your kids talk to you and you write down something that they're feeling. Or gratitude. If you want to work with gratitude, it's something that your kids maybe talk to you about what they're grateful for and you write down what they're grateful for. Um, hugging looking at the sky, looking at the sky, seeing what shapes the sky, the, the clouds are making, or just being out in nature is a coping strategy. It helps us to feel calm. And kids having the opportunity to play with a favorite toy is a coping strategy. Next slide, please, Amy. Okay, so I want you to go back to the chat box. Think of that behavior your child does that gets to you. And think about from that list of coping strategies, can you think of something from that list that may be helpful to them in getting calm? And share that with me in the chat box. What's a coping strategy you think would be useful with your kids? Anything coming through? I'm not seeing any coping strategies. Okay, breathing and counting, absolutely. Breathing and counting is helpful. Baking, yeah, if you've got that opportunity and your little one wants to bake, that's a great way to connect and help them get calm. Okay, great suggestion. So think about as we go through oh, going to relax in his room. Yeah, some kids will do that, um, especially if it's not seen as a punishment. Taking a break, um, taking some time out done positively is a great one. And that's ultimately what we do want to do for our kids. We want to teach them when you're feeling upset, rather than acting out you're on, your on your emotions, take time to, to, to relax, take time to take a break. And that break can be in your room. You're not in trouble, you're not punished but you can take a break in your room until your body and your thinking get back to calm. Okay, so fabulous ideas, and you've got a list of things that you can be working with with your kids. But here's the thing for us parents. Um, a dysregulated adult cannot regulate a dysregulated child. So we have to find ways for us to get calm. We need our own coping strategies. Your kids will mirror your feelings, okay? So being calm always starts with us, the parents. When we pause to breathe, when we take space to feel calm by tapping into our own coping strategy, your kids will observe that. And it teaches them, it models for them using a coping strategy when you're upset and you need to get calm. So really important that we stay calm and not join the chaos but not easy to do, so hard to do. So really parents, this is not about perfection. It's about the awareness of your emotional state. That awareness comes before change. So just what I'm asking you to do now is just think about your feelings, think about your habits. Um, when your kids are upset, where's your emotional state at? Are you joining the chaos? Are you able to stay calm? Um, and give yourself grace when needed. Amy, we actually need to be back one slide. Um, and give yourself grace when needed, um, because like I said, it's not easy to do. We're doing our best. It's not about perfect parenting. It's really about just trying our, re our, really, our real best in these difficult situations. 
So once our kids are regulated, once we're regulated, now we're ready for the next slide, Amy. Now we are able to problem solve, okay? But we can't do this until our kids have coped, we have coped, and everybody's calm. This is the last step in the process, which is problem solving. And there's four steps to problem solving. Figuring out what is the problem, thinking of some solutions, and then evaluating the solutions. What would happen if we chose a particular solution? Would it be safe? Would it be fair? And how would everybody feel with that solution? If it meets those criteria, it's a great solution and we can give it a try. So if your kids, you know, let's say it is fighting with a sibling over a toy and you decide that, you know what, maybe taking turns with the toy is the way we want to solve this problem next time instead of hitting a sibling for grabbing the toy, you would want to teach your kids how to go through this process um, to evaluate and come up with those solutions. So this handout is available on the slide. If for some reason it doesn't print out or you can't print it out, feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to send you a proper PDF format of this, um, this um, problem solving sheet. Because really important, even from our toddler stage, we want to be talking to our toddlers about this. And certainly with our preschoolers, we want to be working with them, teaching them how to solve those problems. Because this is where we get to actually manage the behavior. What could they do differently? How could they go back and do it differently in terms of managing their behavior? So I hope that makes sense. Starting with the emotions, how do we manage those emotions first? And then we get to problem solving and figuring out how do we want to solve this problem? How do we want to work with the, the misbehavior that we've been dealing with? Next slide, please, Amy. Okay. The other thing is, considering shifting your mindset regarding your kid's undesirable behavior, we offer, oops, gone too far. Back one, Amy. Thank you. Uh, we often interpret undesirable behavior as disobedience or manipulation, but it's not the case. What if we chose to interpret the misbehavior as communication of a need instead? So behavior is never random. It is always communication. And that's what you're looking at right now is we're trying to understand why. Why is a child having the emotional reaction they're having? Or why is our child behaving the way that they're behaving? What's the behavior communicating? Okay, that's what we're trying to figure out. So I always share with parents that we want to get curious about our kids' behavior, not furious about their behavior. What are our kids trying to tell us? What do we need to know? Okay, next slide, please, Amy. Okay, so that's it for understanding, you know, our kids' behavior. We need to make sure that we manage the emotions first. Then we can start to problem solve, figure out how we want to address the behavior. And as we're looking to address the behavior, we want to be looking at um, what that behavior may be communicating. So what you actually don't have on the slide is some of the things that kids are communicating. Amy, we can actually go back one slide. I'm sorry. Let's go back to this. Some of the things that your kids are, are communicating when it is their you know, misbehavior is connection. Um, misbehavior, kids are often looking for connection. It's usually the first place that I go to when families are struggling with misbehavior is to see what's happening around connection. So sometimes behavior is also communicating a basic need. Maybe they're hungry, maybe they're tired. Maybe it's communicating a slower pace. Overscheduled kids won't tell you with their words that they're overscheduled, but they definitely will end up telling you with their behavior. Um, so maybe they need help understanding or handling their emotions. We just spoke about that. How can you help your kids with their emotions um, with their behavior? Maybe they need more or less stimulation. That's the other thing to consider right now for our kids is um, when we look at, um, when we're looking at their behavior, are your kids bored? Boredom is definitely going to increase um, behavior. So looking if they need to have some more stimulation. Kids need to feel safe. They need to be comforted. They need to feel reassured. There's a lot of anxiety that's happening right now, especially around COVID. So could behavior be communicating some anxiety? Your kids are not going to express anxiety the same way that adults do. It's going to come out in their behavior. 
Um, another one for our kids is, is control. Sometimes they want to have some control and this one often gets overlooked, especially someone had typed in the beginning, if we've got strong-willed kids, they need that autonomy, they need that control. And when we take that away, we're going to see behavior. Um, boundaries is another reason for communication. Are we not respecting their boundaries? Maybe they don't want to give someone a hug. Maybe they don't want to share a toy and we're forcing them to do that when we disrespect our kids' boundaries, when we're not aware of our kids' boundaries. Those could be um, communicated through behavior. So, so many different things that your kids could be communicating through their behavior. We need to be aware of what that behavior is communicating. So I hope that helps you understand emotions. I hope it helps you understand behavior. It gives you some direction of where you want to go in terms of managing your kids' emotions and dealing with their behavior that comes from those emotions. And for the last few minutes, I want to get into some of those community questions that did come in from parents that were asking about um, how do I, you know, questions about how do I manage behaviors with my toddler or preschooler during COVID. So first question that came in, my preschooler hates his virtual classes, but misses his school friends so much. How can I best support him through this? Oh my gosh, so many parents are asking me that question. So many preschoolers love being at school, but they don't love being on their virtual classes. So I'm saying to parents, pick and choose which of the virtual classes they want to be on. Let them do what they can. Uh, or what they do enjoy. They don't have to be on for the full amount of time. Maybe it's just a few minutes for the greeting in the beginning, just to see their friends' faces, and they're done. That's okay, let them off after that. Maybe one of them is a story time and they're happy to go in for the story time, but they don't wanna go on for a Zoom call that's maybe arts and crafts. So let your preschooler pick which part of the class they want to do, even if it's just a few minutes, that's great. But then we come to the next piece, it's how do I support them through this because our kids are missing their friends a lot. So, so hard for our little guys, but some of the things really we want to set up some virtual play dates. Even if they don't do much during that play date, even if it's just the computers on Zoom next to each other and your kids are playing next to the computer, just that parallel play next to each other gives your kids some social connection with their friends. Setting up, um, hosting a movie night. So you can do a Netflix party where they get together with friends and they can watch a movie together. So you may have to coordinate that and get that going, but sometimes just being able to watch that together with a friend, there's some social connection. Netflix also allows you if you, um, Netflix also allows you if you, you can communicate. You may have to be there and help them with that communicate, but you can actually send texts via Netflix and if the parents are watching the movie with them, absolutely fabulous. You can type in things that they want to say to their friends and get that response. You could also read a favorite book to a friend. So maybe you and your little one sit in front of Zoom and read your favorite story, and then their friend reciprocates another time with their parent and reads a favorite story back, and you get to see your friend while they're reading that story. Um, drawing a picture that you can either drop at a friend, but the time that they take to draw the picture, the thought and the um, feelings that go into making that picture for their friends, a um, connection that's happening. And then you can either drive by and drop that picture, at a friend, with a picture to their friend. So that's another way to keep socially connected. Websites that you can go on and they can play games together. Pogo.com is one of those websites. Um, again, parents are going to have to help to coordinate that and navigate that with our preschoolers, but that's another way for our kids
All right, I'm so sorry. That was my computer that just blew me out. Um, so I'm back on just to finish up those last questions. Um, so anyway, so that's it with the social skills, helping our little guys with that. Um, the next question that came in was, how to explain COVID to an almost three-year-old? Originally, we said that school was on spring break, but never fully discussed what was really going on. She's seen people wearing masks on our walks and the park taped off and knows that we can't go to the stores, but I don't want to scare her by telling her too much. So here's the thing, our kids are perceptive. They know that something different is going on than spring break, and they actually worry more if they're kept in the dark. So we do want to give them information and we want to be reassuring at the same time. So my advice is this, we set the tone. Listen to the news, you listen to the news, filter out the information you don't want, filter in the information you do want, and then share with your kids what you feel is appropriate for them. We want to be developmentally appropriate, so don't give them too much information. It's overwhelming and it can be scary. Give them the information that you need them to have, give it to them in short, simple, calm explanation, and it doesn't need to be long-winded explanations, just short, sweet, and simple keeping it developmentally or age appropriate. You want to welcome their questions, answer their questions calmly, answer their questions factually. If there's something you don't know, let them know. You know what, mommy doesn't know the answer to that question and I'll find out an information around that and I'll get back to you with that question. And then find out what you can, give them back that information, make sure that you do come back to them with the information. But it's okay to let them know that you don't know that right now and you'll find out that information for them. So welcome their questions. Be reassuring. Um, let your kids know it's unlikely that kids will catch the virus. Um, it's not something that's very good. And then focus with that. We also want to focus on what we're doing to keep safe. So know that they're like having a cold or back cold or the flu and you don't feel good. Um, so that's why we're taking the, the, the protections that we have and focus on what we're doing to stay safe, which is to let your little guys know that that's why we're washing hands. That's why we're wearing masks. And again, if you want to give these little ones some control over the situation, when you're washing hands, let them pick the song that they want to sing. We want to wash for 20 seconds, but our kids can pick which song that is. Is it the happy birthday song twice? Is it the ABCs? Do they have another favorite song that they think? Let them know it's not a one and done conversation. We want to keep the conversation going. So any time your questions, you can come back with more questions if something else comes into your mind. Okay, reassuring information rather than pretending that it's just spring break or that this is, there's nothing going. Next question is some helpful tips to balance discipline and understanding. It's hard on all of us I'm talking and is obviously frustrated with the current situation um, and limitations. So I hope. The, the information I gave you at the beginning that's for you. Best is connection before correction um, with, with dealing with those emotions. The other is just to make sure that you have very clear limits, boundaries, and expectations for your kids. Letting them know what behavior is not okay. Back talking is not okay. Letting them know what will happen if they do back talk. If you back talk, I will ask you to repeat it, the question in a polite way. If you back talk, I will walk away. I'm not going to stay for rude behavior, but I will come back for polite behavior. So really letting our kids know the limits, the boundaries, the expectations, those need to be clear. And for behaviors that are happening continually, letting them know what the consequences for that would be, how you will manage that when they back talk or when they ABC, whatever it is, fill in the blank. Um, they have all that information up, up front. And then you're going to follow through again, calmly, evenly, rationally, just follow through with what it is you said that you were going to do to manage that behavior. No emotions involved. Okay, I hope that helps with that question. And then we have one final question. Um, screen time. 
is all the screen time doing long-term damage to my toddler's brain? So no, it's not. Hopefully they're not watching six, seven, eight hours of TV. Um, but if your kids are getting a little bit extra screen time than what they're used to, don't feel bad about it. Um, we are all using screens a lot more right now. And impact comes when it's not short term. This is gonna be, even though it feels like it's weeks or maybe a few months, but when we talk about impact happening, we're talking about years of excessive TV watching and that we'll start to do some damage. But the short term that we're talking about, a few weeks, a few months, and a little bit extra screen time is not gonna damage your toddler's brain. And the other thing I wanna share with you around that is a few guidelines around TV time or screen time that makes it a little bit more healthy for your kids is whenever possible, watch the show with your kids. Talk to them about what's happening. Um, so it's not just something that they watch on their own and nothing follows up with it. If you watch it with them at times, you can follow up with conversations. You can follow up with some of the learning that happened during that TV show. You can expand on the learning through conversation, through questions, or through games that you play. You can expand on some of the learning that maybe they watched during that, uh, that they saw during that show. Um, a great website and a great resource for your parents is um, commonsensemedia.org. Common Sense Media gives a list of um, age appropriate shows and games that are really great for kids to be watching. So we wanna make sure that if they are watching something that it's also high content, you know, educational programs or quality content that's in there. And um, commonsensemedia.org will help you to figure out what is quality screen time for your kids knowing that they're gonna get some extra screen time right now. Okay, um, next slide please, Amy. All right, so this takes us to the end of our presentation and just a final thought, unconditional love. At the end of the day, your little ones need to know that they're loved regardless of their behavior. They need to feel safe, they need to feel seen, they need to feel soothed and they need to feel secure. So find, find the love, find the compassion, find the empathy right now. I know it's hard. So that may mean finding your moments for some self-care, stepping out of your parenting role for a little bit when you can, taking a break when you can. Um, that's gonna help you to be in a space of more generous, more loving, more kind, more, compassionate towards your little ones and working with that unconditional love so that we can do the work that we need to to raise kids that are happy, healthy, and well-adjusted. And at the end of the day, really for right now, it's not about the academics. It's really about knowing that we can, we can get through this time and we can help our kids get through this time, socially, emotionally, and mentally intact. That's the goal. So find time to play, find time to have fun with your kids, mental and emotional health as well. And with that, next slide, Amy. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'm here to help you. Um, parenting was never meant to be done alone. So if you have questions, if you need me, if you want that handout on, um, on problem solving, please feel free to reach out and contact me. I'd be happy to help you. And keep working on that emotional regulation for you and for your kids. And if you can work with that emotional piece, will make a big difference in that behavioral piece that you guys are struggling with. So thank you so much for joining me. Enjoy your little ones and have a wonderful evening.